Welcome, Laura. It's great to have you on the Poundcast today. Thank you. Great to be here. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I... Uh, I'm with uh, the Crypto Council for Innovation at the moment. I'm the UK policy lead. Uh, I've been doing that since about September last year. Uh, prior to that, I've been doing uh, broader crypto assets and, and fintech consulting. Um, and before that, I spent about eight years at the FCA, um, joined uh, doing kind of broader governance policy and then moved over to the newly established innovation department um, within the FCA uh, and then ended up uh, managing a few teams and then running the whole department. So that included all the FCA's fintech programme. So everything from Sandbox, uh, direct support advice units, uh, the global financial innovation hub, GFIN, and uh, most relevantly now, the crypto asset policy team as well. Thanks very much. And I'm very excited to have you on the Poundcast today because we're going to talk about why we are where we are in terms of crypto asset regulation in the UK and more specifically stablecoin regulation in the UK um, at the moment. And there's there's a fair bit of historical context to this, which, which I know you're well acquainted um, for the benefit of our Poundcast listeners who um may not be expecting a discussion of wider crypto assets from us, given we usually are more focused on, on new forms of digital money. I think it's it's important to bear in mind that when we're talking about this topic, we're talking about um, we, we while the, the Digital Pound Foundation specifically considers stable coins um, and other new forms of digital money, obviously we have to look at these in the context of the wider crypto asset landscape when we're considering some of the wider policy and regulatory um, challenges and um, events at the moment and things like that. So I think just to get started, Laura, um, can you define crypto assets for us and explain you know, maybe a little bit of context around what is captured as crypto asset and what is out of scope. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I will I will caveat that I'm not a lawyer, so none of these are going to be legal definitions. This is quite a this is quite colloquial. So I would describe crypto assets as something that is uh, a cryptographically secured representation of uh, a value or right you and that will be based on some form of distributed ledger technology um and typically those crypto assets can be transferred stored or or traded electronically that's how i would kind of broadly describe it um now in terms of what is captured from a crypto asset perspective interestingly it, it's, it, it's, it, there's a dual, duality to this because because from a uh, a traditional financial services perspective, actually not as much is captured within the regulatory perimeter at the moment as some people might think. So things that are going to be defined as a security already will have existing securities regulations applied to them. Um, but what we haven't had yet is much expansion of the perimeter from Treasury to allow the FCA or as relevant the Bank of England to fully regulate crypto assets as a uh, as a new form of financial instrument as a new form of regulated activity. The the flip side to that is there is a piece around financial promotions, which I'm sure we'll go into um, that specifically just governs the, the marketing of crypto assets. Now, all forms of crypto assets are captured within that. It's an incredibly broad, broad piece of legislation, but it does sit slightly separately to the traditional Financial Services and Markets Act, which is where the regulator gets most of its uh, powers from. So you've kind of got these two pieces at the moment operating on, on slightly different timelines. Um, but at the moment, it's fair to say that uh, auth full authorization and regulation from the FCA, by and large, doesn't apply yet to most crypto assets. Okay, so um, I think if we go back in time, you know, there was the 2019 FCA consultation um, on the crypto asset regulatory perimeter, and it established some things around the treatment of um, tokenized financial instruments. So financial instruments that are in the current regulatory perimeter that have been tokenized um, and things that sit outside of that perimeter that fell into a broader bucket of um, 
crypto assets. And I think it would be, you know, quite useful probably for listeners to understand whether the process of tokenization of something that is already regulated, such as, for example, a financial instrument, as per the MIFID definition, so a bond or, you know, uh, an equity or another type of security, um, or, um, and perhaps this is a different discussion, um, e-money, for example, the mere act of tokenization brings that within some of the considerations for crypto asset regulation or do they sit outside entirely so that's i mean that's a really interesting question and that's certainly something that's been discussed very uh, you know lively with industry and regulators i think um it, for, for me as a as a kind of observer to all this it feels like regulators would prefer the tokenization of uh, anything that might represent a digital asset to be in a new in, in it within new sets of regulation, um, even when there, I, I've seen compelling arguments from industry as to why to keep some of that stuff within a regime like e-money. Um, I think some of that might be around the risk appetite of the regulator and how they are generally viewing this stuff. There's certainly more conversations happening on in that grey area around where because this is a spectrum, um, and so at one end of the spectrum certainly looks a lot more like the financial instruments that the regulators have been managing for decades and presenting a risk profile for from a market perspective and from a consumer perspective that the FCA has already gotten itself very comfortable with. Um, so I think we're still seeing some of that play out, but it will be interesting as the FCA in particular starts to you know, come out with uh, more robust frameworks around crypto assets to to look at what that interplay is because at the moment we've had discussion papers but we haven't seen any uh, what I would call a, a real legal instrument and you know, attached to a consultation paper that actually talks about how this is going to work in practice and I think until we see kind of rubber hit the road then it's it's still a little bit all to play for. <laughs> okay, so let's take it. Let's take a big step back. Um, tell us about, you know, let's let's have a potted history of crypto asset regulation in the UK. Um, when did crypto assets first come to the attention of the FCA? <clears throat> and, 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 and it's not just about the FCA as well. I think, you know, the, the FCA has to be given the mandate to actually take action. And so how have crypto assets been considered and treated over time? by H&T, the Bank of England, kind of other authorities. Um, and how have we arrived at the situation where, where we are now, mm. basically, where, you know, some years following that original consultation by the FCA on the crypto asset regulatory perimeter, we've still not actually seen any regulation in place. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll try to keep this as potted as possible because <laughs> I think we could fill a whole hour with just this. Um, so... I guess thinking about where this started, it. So I, I'm just trying to recall the timeline. So I moved across to the in what was then the Innovate team in the FCA um, in around 2017. So uh, a regulatory sandbox had already been established, but the team were not looking at crypto assets per se. Um, they were interacting with tokens where firms in the sandbox might be looking at them, but that was kind of the extent of it. One of the reasons I moved over to the team was to establish a, a what was then going to be a fintech policy team, um, given I had policy experience in the FCA already. When I joined, um, this was the point at which some, you know, there, there were some big price jumps in Bitcoin, and I think it was starting to capture the imagination of government. So the Treasury select. So this is 2014, Adam? right? This is 20 no, 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 this is later than this. We're in about 20, this is about 2017. Um, now, the Treasury Select Committee, uh, which has the the power to basically call the FCA in front of them and grill them about you know a variety of topics, they decided they wanted to do an inquiry on cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. Um, and that was probably the first real foray into this space for government. Um, and it became, I think, clear at that point that this was something that we were going to continue to work on. And our, one of the things that came out of that was the tripartite 
crypto asset task force, which was the FCA, the Bank of England and Treasury, seemed like a very sensible place to start on a an industry that was still very nascent, very immature. Lots of reflection on all sides that at that point, there wasn't any need for a full regulatory framework. We weren't in that space. It was still like, let's work out what we're doing, where the, the market's going to go. Um, so, you know, we were we were active in that. Um, the uh, guidance, uh, the perimeter guidance that you referenced, I'm, I'm glad you liked that because that was my team. Um, you know, because the FCA had its sandbox, we were speaking a lot with industry and participants were saying to us, we just don't know how the perimeter interacts with tokens. We, you know, we want more clarity. And, you know, I at the time didn't believe that clarity meant more rules. I genuinely, genuinely believed that clarity meant guidance um, and a, and perimeter guidance for me has always been a really effective regulatory tool and often one that you know people forget about particularly if you don't know the full suite of uh, tools and interventions that are at your disposal as a regulator because it, you know, can can you explain for the benefit of the you know our listeners what who may not be acquainted as well what perimeter guidance is and and what the, you know the FCA did in the sense mm. of that. so essentially as with any guidance a, a, a guidance document provides industry a firm with a way of meeting the underlying requirements in the rules you don't have to do what the guidance says but basically if you follow the guidance you will by and large, be compliant with the rules. So it is a good way of explaining the rationale behind a set of rules if they're if they're complex or slightly different to other things. If if industry needs that, so you can you can apply guidance across the piece across any piece of regulation. Perimeter guidance is um, is specifically about what is in and out of scope from a regulatory perspective, not because the perimeter isn't set by the FCA. The FCA's perimeter is set by Treasury. So this was a way of saying to industry, well, these are the tokens that we would consider to be already captured within within the the regulatory perimeter. These are the things that we would consider to be outside. These are the things we would contemplate as part of an exercise to make that judgment. So. A guidance document doesn't change the existing rules, in this case, the existing perimeter. It just provides greater clarity. And at that point, I felt that would be a really effective intervention because it didn't it wasn't incredibly heavy lift. We didn't have to change any rules or anything like that, but it just gave industry some clarity. And I think it was really well received at the time. So at, at that point in time, that kind of 2017 to 2019, there was quite a lot going on, a lot of thought going into it. Um, we had a steady stream of inflow from industry via things like the sandbox so we we were in very good shape the, i think the first left field thing to come along was was facebook and libra that really that really kind of stirred the pot to be honest um it was an unexpected move and regulators around the world panicked to be to be quite honest um because suddenly you know they were being presented with something that could have you know huge systemic importance from the moment it was launched if it was ever to be launched um from a an organization that wasn't a traditional financial services organization so there were lots of layers to this um and i was certainly involved in the what they were called regulatory colleges then so um the eu in particular was pulling together regulators from across the, the european region to meet with facebook regularly discuss what was happening so that was a real impetus for many jurisdictions to really kick off their own regulatory work streams. Um, you know, it's not the only reason, but it's certainly for me one of the reasons why stablecoins has crossed the line more quickly than others because of those in initial impetus pieces. Um, so everything was kind of lined up nicely to, you know, start to get some of these this proper regulatory implementation in place. Um, I, you know, when people talk about the financial promotions regime now and a, a growing concern that its implementation has been has been difficult. We were talking about FinProms back in back in 2018, um, again, in the context of an immature and nascent industry that wouldn't be able to handle full kind of MIFID like regulation. Um, again, back then, I stand by this, it made sense, it made sense to, to do a targeted intervention that would protect consumers from what was at that point, some very shoddy marketing, um, and people not knowing any better. I, I think, 
you know, COVID then plays a massive part in this. Um, and that is in the, in the, slow in the slowdown. Yeah, because, you are you know, by the end of 2019, things are really, you know, good pace. Like uh, even the, the 2020, you know, I, I was in Singapore in, in February as Singapore was shutting down. And I was there for an FSB meeting that was talking about innovation, talking about crypto assets. So, you know, global regulators and global industry standard setters were, were talking about this at the right time. But then COVID kind of redirected everybody. Um, so whilst it does look now that things have been incredibly slow and they have been objectively, there are some reasons that are beyond the control of the FCA, beyond the control of the government that have caused this slowdown. Um, and COVID was a big one of those. I, mean, I, I spent, I went on maternity leave at the end of 2020, but I spent that March to December basically having to manage my innovation department but my day job was actually you know liaising with treasury on things like bounce back loans um a whole other set of stuff that really had nothing to do with the other you know <laughs> so moving anything forward was incredibly difficult and i know firms were frustrated by that we had firms going through the authorization process um and the mlr licensing process that you know, it should have been taking months and frankly, it was taking more like years. Um, so it was a, a kind of a perfect storm in terms of some of the slowdown. Then I think the regulators started to come out of that, let's say, late 2021, early 2022, and refocus a little bit. Now, Treasury was able to kind of realign itself a little bit faster that's because of the type of organization it is it's it's a lot leaner it can move a lot faster but the gap with the fca had already kind of established itself i think so we're in this sort of strange place now where it feels like why are we not further ahead like why have we only had a discussion paper on stable coins like why have we not got legislation already out there and i say i think the reason behind that is is complex it's it's very easy to just say the fca has been too slow here and not done a good enough job now i'm not saying that there the fca isn't partially to blame in this situation but i think it's it's a more complicated picture if you if you kind of track back over time so I'm gonna I'm gonna pause there with my at my attempt at a potted history. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. And I think you know you raised some really interesting points there, which is the fact that 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 regulatory perimeter, the set of things that the FCA has competence and jurisdiction over that it can make rules about, is not set by the FCA. It's set by Treasury. And so the things that were identified as being outside the regulatory perimeter in 2019 through that consultation process and that, you know, um, they, they need to be brought within the regulatory perimeter for the FCA by HMT and by enabling legislation as well in order for the FCA to then do something about it and to get on with the business of regulating it. Um, and, you know, in, in that context, it's been discussed as well that, like, the FCA has actually done as much as it can with the limited tools that it has. Some might argue that it went a bit far with the crypto MLR registration process, which I think, you know, for a lot of firms appears to be more like a lightweight authorization or not even a particularly lightweight authorization, but to have the equivalent like, you know, um, documentation and disclosures and things like that made as an authorization process. Um, I mean, it's, so we've gotten up to probably sometime last year. Um, and then what happened in terms of the, you know, Financial Services Markets Act and the, you know, bringing things into scope? And how are things progressing now that we that, um, you know, certain activities are being moved into the regulatory perimeter? Mm -hmm. What are we looking? What's the what's the timeline for all parties involved in this process? What are some of the key dependencies? Um, and What's in particular, you know, from the DPF's perspective, the outlook um, looking for a stable coins? Yeah. So you've already talked about the, the interplay between Treasury and the FCA in terms of regulatory perimeter. So the the Financial Services and Markets Bill, now, now the Act, has extended the remit of the FCA to allow it to regulate stable coins, which is an, a very good first step. There are some additional pieces of... 
uh, regulation that need to be brought in just to kind of finalise those powers. They will be done through secondary legislation and or statutory instruments, so likely to be finalised soon. Um, Treasury, uh, EST, the Chancellor have said multiple times that, that those final pieces of legislation will be done in or by the summer. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll take that as, as green, given it's looking like an election is going to be later in the year rather than earlier. So we will hope that those final pieces will be in place. That will allow then the, the FCA and indeed the Bank of England to, you know, fully issue consultation papers. As I, as I mentioned earlier, we've already had a discussion paper. So the main difference between a discussion paper and a consultation paper is a discussion paper is earlier stage. It doesn't have to come with a legal instrument. So on a topic like this, which is for new firms, it's new activities, it's a, a complex area. It's a good way of starting to engage with industry around these are the kinds of things we're thinking about and getting that early stage feedback. So that's why I think the FCA and the bank have gone down this route. But now they do need to issue consultation papers. And I think we'll see them pretty soon after we get the final pieces of, of legal implementation. You know, in, in theory, the the regulators have to wait for those to be in place. You can do it at risk if you as a regulator feel confident in what is in those statutory instruments. But if something happens at the very, you know, the, the very last kind of couple of days, something changes, you would legally be required to consult again, which is a massive undertaking, which is why you would normally, from a timeline perspective, see the instruments out there and quickly afterwards issue a consultation. You know, it, it's pretty clear to me that the FCA in particular is working on those as we speak. There have been a series of roundtables going on to garner really in-depth feedback. So I think it's clear that they are they are working on those documents as we speak. So let's say we do get something out in the summer and that, that's not going to be impacted by any parliamentary um, perda because obviously if we go into an election period then FCA won't publish any big pieces of consult of of um of policy it to be clear it's allowed it's not that it's it's prohibited from doing so the bank is because it's a uh, it's it's part of the government the FCA is an independent regulator so it is allowed to issue policy however it wouldn't because that could have political connotations. So generally, the period running up to election is, uh, is is very quiet externally for the regulators. So if the election is later in the year, then I think it's safe to say we, we should have seen a consultation paper come out already. That would, as, as, as is usually the case, be a three month consultation period. The FCA will then will take those responses, work up a final policy statement and issue that you know, let's say that's early, early next year, because that would allow maybe six months between the consultation uh, paper and the policy statement, it, it then would need an implementation, a, a transitional phase as well. Uh, my guess would be that way, it would be somewhere between six and 12 months, depending on how firms, how firms lobby, it might be it might be sort of tranched based on different kinds of firms. Um, but I think all in, we should be looking at implemented stablecoin regulation by the end of next year. So the end of 2025, I think we will actually have something applicable for firms. Be my yeah, yeah, yeah. Bold. And that's, assuming, <laughs> that's assuming that there's no snap. Oh yeah, yeah. Then then uh, well, then all yeah, bets are off. That, then, yeah. That, that's assuming that yes, that that H and T finalizes its statutory instruments in good time, and that the consultations are out and the consultation process completes, and um, that you know everything progresses against that timeline, then we should have a regime in place by the end of next year. Um, and without going into the detail, um, because I, I know we're both exhausted from this topic, you know, I think there were some s significant challenges with um, some of the proposals in the discussion papers, for example, that much of the industry is hoping will be addressed um, when they see any draft rules in the consultation process as well. Um, so do you think that that is going to, to add time or is that very much worked into your timeline? I think that is is worked into my timeline. I um, I say I, I think it's really a really good move from the regulators that they are, they are doing these roundtables now. They are, you know, they are sort of five hour sessions. They're asking firms for input ahead of time. So there is 
meaningful engagement going on, on meaningful opportunity for firms to say, these are the areas we have an issue with. And particularly from the FCA's perspective, as a as a policy exercise, I think what they're doing is very sensible. They are taking the exi- existing handbook, saying, right, well, the, this set of regulations would apply in this way. How does that work? And, and kind of going almost chapter by chapter, which is, is a a sensible framework to do this within. Now it's just about drilling down into those details and finding areas that are not workable. We don't think the risk appetite's quite in the right place um, because we do need to we do need to balance this and compare crypto, crypto asset firms and the risks they pose from a market integrity and a consumer perspective against other firms in the market. And you know there does need to be a, a comparator here. So. We will, we will see once the consultation paper is out there, you know, where the FCA has landed on some of this stuff. If there is significant pushback from industry, then yes, things things might take a little bit longer. It also depends on what uh, any potential new incoming government thinks about this as well. Um, because whilst, you know, the, the legislative places, pieces will be in place for the FCA to do this. And the FCA is, as I said, an independent regulator. If the if the government takes a certain view, it can apply quite a lot of pressure um, or it could cause things to delay if other priorities come up the list. So it's not a case of once kind of once the legislative pieces are in place, there's like nothing will stop this. It's it still requires, Mm -hmm. you know, impetus and desire on kind of all state from it from all stakeholders to get this across the line. And this is for phase yes. one of uh, the crypto asset. So this is for stable coins. Um, looking at the other phases, what do they encompass? And at very high level, what are the timelines and some of the key considerations for those? Yeah. Um, I mean, from a from a policy perspective, you would have to repeat the whole exercise. Um, there will need to be new legislation laid for the FCA to 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 be able to regulate these firms if we if if we go down a which is what i've heard talked about before is after stable coins we looked at broader backed crypto assets and then go into a, a broader unbacked crypto assets if we if we go down go down that road um and then the fca will have to do its internal thinking its consultation papers its policy statements it is a it is a long timeline my understanding is that treasury has been contemplating this broader regime um now i I can't imagine anything is going to be done prior to an election that seems highly unlikely um and any anything that comes out afterwards will require sign off from the government at that point Um, and i don't think i'm saying anything highly controversial to to note that observers at the moment seem to be uh, of the view that we'll be having a Labour government, that's slightly more likely than a, to re- retain the existing Conservative government. So that is a whole different set of political factors that we'll need to be contemplating. Um, we've had a Conservative mm-hmm. government in post for 14 years now, an incoming Labour government at any point in time would always want to change up its priorities and change its agenda. You overlay that with a, a quite extreme economic environment at the moment. So there is a there is a lot happening. So I, I guess that's a roundabout way of saying if we have a change of government, I, I find it highly unlikely that they're going to come in and say our number one priority is crypto assets. Um, now, in, in some ways, that might be uh, beneficial because it, it allows the regulators the time and the space to to think about how it wants to approach this. Um, On the downside, if you need to create space in the legislative timetable and get it up the agenda, it it might be tricky. Um, I do think it presents a huge potential opportunity for industry, though, to start to re-engage with government, say, you know, explain explain this stuff to them why is it important where do we think the risks are what is the right approach for this stuff so it's you're almost kind of why getting a clean slate a little bit and that can go that can go either way um so i'm deliberately not putting any timelines on it because i i I really wouldn't like to guess it it's going to take time i would say that if there is a big market event you know nothing you know sort of focuses minds like a big failure so if a you know if a big crypto asset firm goes under if there's a big issue then we might suddenly see this uh, pop up higher on the agenda again and what does all this mean from the 
point of view of firms, uh, the UK's position um, in terms of crypto asset services, um, innovation in this space, um, and, and the UK's attractiveness as well, because I think one of the things that we saw, um, you know, one of those those possibly intended, but probably unintended, classic unintended consequences of regulation um, under the, the crypto MLR registration regime, a firm that is established in the UK um, and is providing crypto asset services in the UK has to go through the crypto MLR registration process. But because crypto provision of crypto services is not yet a regulated activity in the UK, it was fine for a firm to establish themselves outside the UK bypass all those requirements and provide services on a cross-border basis into the UK, given again, they're unregulated at the moment. Um, and so this is almost an incentive for firms to not establish themselves in the UK. So if we're going through a prolonged period, potentially, of more uncertainty for the, um, you know, phase two and phase three crypto assets, then what ultimately will this mean in the long run for the UK's attractiveness and competitiveness? And this must be something that you're considering with your Crypto Council for Innovation members um, and stakeholders and things like that. Mm, well. Absolutely. And I, I think we're at a real crossroads now. The The UK has always, not just in crypto assets, but in, in fintech generally, been regarded as a as a global leader from its engagement with industry, from the, the market it has onshore, from the way it regulates. Like it has been a jurisdiction to, to look to for other policymakers, to aspire to be in for firms and to want to you know, set up as a startup and, and stay in. I, I do think we're starting to lose that now as other jurisdictions around the world become become more favorable in and in and when, but when I say favorable I mean that from from many different angles from a clarity from a regulatory perspective from a stability of market perspective so you know what does that mean for for firms thinking about coming into the UK or contemplating whether whether they want to stay in the UK I don't think we're seeing at the moment a massive kind of offshoring of firms to other jurisdictions but if I'm if I'm being candid, I don't think that's because the UK is doing particularly well. I just think it's not doing as badly as some other jurisdictions, namely the US. Now we've we've got the certainty and the clarity we need in the UK. That's not really why. But it's not it's not where you want to benchmark yourself, is it? That's that's the problem, you know, going, well, we're not quite as bad as, you know, what's going on over there. However, again, we're, we're coming up to an election in the US. Um, there have been several meaningful attempts to get bipartisan legislation um, through the Senate. So uh, the US just has to nail some of this stuff and suddenly they will be streets ahead of the UK. Um, and the US is always going to be an attractive market for crypto asset firms. So you know, it, it, we do need to think about that from a, from a from a UK perspective. And, you know, the government has been talking for a long time about the UK being a global hub for crypto assets. We've heard this statement pushed out, you know, in, in big conferences, in speeches, you know, year after year now. And, you know, what has that meant in practice? Well, well not an awful lot, to be honest. You know, we've got uh, you know, stage one of stablecoin legislation, but that really isn't enough to to create this global hub that the government has frequently been saying that it wants. Um, so I think whilst we're not seeing that movement at the moment, we are at real risk of the UK becoming, frankly, a fast follower in a space that has always been a global leader. And that will be a huge shame because those those advantages are easily lost, but very, very hard to, to gain back again. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, one of the points that a number of people have raised at some of those um, FCA roundtables and other discussions with regulators um, has been that around market access and crypto assets being a, a truly global asset class, um, both by, you know, design and intention and the nature of the market as well. Um, and the importance of not designing regulation in a vacuum because 
because of this global nature, the fact that, you know, some activities in order to be regulated require significant degrees of international cooperation. And obviously, um, you know, mentioning you mentioned the US, which as a major jurisdiction, um, the, the, the absence of clarity around, you know, key tenets of, you know, crypto asset regulation and the, the applicability of their own regulatory perimeter is, um, you know, a- alarming and, um, and, and certainly a, a cause for practical concern on a day-to-day <laughs> basis for many firms. Um, but post, post-Brexit in particular, is there also a question about, you know, which jurisdictions might be more favourable to establish oneself in due to that potential for greater market access. I mean, there's still, in the, the UK is a single jurisdiction, you know, pre-Brexit, you could establish yourself in the UK and have access to an EU market. Um, now that's no longer the case. Um, are we likely to see more um, firms establishing themselves in the EU so that they can be regulated there and still potentially while there is this um, you know, this lack of clarity provides services in the cross-border basis into the UK. Do you think that that might be, you know, a model that we see um, growing in popularity over the coming years as Mika takes mm. effect? Yeah, I, I absolutely think that, um, the you know, these shifts do take time. It was never going to be the case that uh, as soon as we left the EU, all firms would up and leave. But we are seeing those those shifts happening. You know, hubs like Ireland, for example, are you know really attracting huge amounts of firms who want to you know want to go into the broader European region. That can uh, you know that that can interact with a regulator and get you know get a kind of hands on experience. It knows what it's got to apply. And I'm not saying that that. Mika is perfect, but at least firms know what they're what they're dealing with. Um, we're still seeing kind of kind of some of the level two and level three stuff playing out. So we're not you know completely final across everything, but it, it's so much further ahead. Um, and if that clarity you know is maintained and the implementation remains consistent, then there is no reason. I mean, what then you have to say to yourself, what has the UK got to offer? Um, it becomes far more of a you know a competitiveness decision for firms to go to where it has that market. Now the UK isn't 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 going to suddenly lose its position in in terms of it being a global market and its importance. I think firms will still want to have some level of presence, some level of access, but it's a it will be a different relationship. It will be to the extent where they will firms might want to headquarter elsewhere and have regional offices or regional presence in the UK. Suddenly the UK becomes a satellite to another country, which is not a position that we mm-hmm. we are used to being in. So, you know, the, the government, the regulators do need to kind of capitalize on this and you know understand what is what is at risk of losing and what the what the stakes are in this because as I say these things take time but they w- once that tanker is moving it's very hard to turn it around um and i think there have been instances where where the government and the regulators have have been have been too too slow to react to some of these seismic changes and too complacent in a a regulator and an approach that was from 10 years ago we don't have to worry what we're going to do because firms aren't going to leave the uk well they are and they will if if this carries on and if other jurisdictions you know we talked about the eu but in a in a market that is global we you know you've got jurisdictions like japan hong kong singapore that are, are streets ahead of this stuff um so there are so many markets that this this can go into um, and i and i worry not, not just in the uk context but some of these bigger regulators that are over here and in the us that the question in their minds is still about should we regulate this stuff do we think crypto really is going to be the future well that that question is at best from five years ago uh the question now is who is going to regulate it do you want it to be you or do you want it to be somebody else and when you phrase the policy making process like that suddenly the outcomes and the impetus really changes yeah and i i think it it's so important to also you know separate out what we're talking about when we talk about crypto because people and I think policymakers quite frequently still hear the word crypto and they are thinking about unbacked 
um, you know, native cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Um, and they're still thinking about, you know, um, NFTs and things like that. And I, I, I think, you know, there's this huge spectrum of, of different types of crypto assets. Um, and many of them represent new and innovative ways to trade, to, to structure and to trade um, assets that have been around for some mm. time. And um, and so therefore, we're not only, you know, it's, it's not as though we're necessarily losing out on um, only this this niche crypto space as a jurisdiction, but potentially we're losing out on a lot of the, um, you know, the foundations of the future yep. of the financial system. Or the absolutely, system. absolutely. I mean, this is not a conversation about, you know, a teenager mining Bitcoin in his parents' basement. I mean, if if the regulators have their way, there'll be certain types of stablecoin that we save with the commercial bank money. This is a huge spectrum of products that directly influences the future of how people in this country engage with money and engage with financial services. It's it's a massive conversation and one that you know we absolutely need to keep having like this. Thanks, Laura. And finally, just as a you know, to, to, to end on a, on a positive <laughs> point after you're clearly someone who's been in the space for a long time and you're also clearly very passionate and excited about it as well. Um, so what's most interesting for you as as a practitioner? Um, you know, with respect to crypto asset regulation, what what appeals to you about it? What keeps you going? Um, you know, even in what is often a frustrating environment. Well, you know, you can take the 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 girl out of the FCA, but you you can't take the FCA out of the girl. So I am I am a policymaker at, at heart, and. You know, the thing that I really get excited about and I really enjoy is the consumer aspect of a lot of this stuff. Uh, we spend so much of our, our professional lives talking to, to firms and individuals, and it's so much about the technology, so much about the back end and the, the kind of the philosophy of, of money, which is, is important. But I always try and pull the conversation back to what does a consumer think? What does a consumer see and feel about this stuff? Because that, for me, is the most fascinating and seismic change here because you know as a policymaker i can sit here and say well this is a this kind of security and we're going to treat this like this and but actually what is if you tap somebody on the on their on the shoulder in the street and you say well what do you think bitcoin is you know what how do you deal with this stuff do you own it what do you think do, is it an investment for you like taking all the the kind of implied meaning away from these words and actually understanding the space it could occupy for 99 percent of the people in this country i think that's a really fascinating space that we don't lean into enough i think the fca does because it has a consumer mandate but even it gets dragged into this kind of middle ground where we all want to debate the the particulars and that's important but we always need to bring this back to what is that front end experience? Because that's where the risk sits as well. You know, that's where people can genuinely lose money, genuinely get hurt, but also where the genuine opportunity is and where you know financial inclusion and cost and access can all play out. So for me, that's that's the bit that really gets me excited. Thanks so much for joining us today, Laura. That's been very interesting for around the history, current state and potential future of crypto asset regulation uh, in the UK and more specifically the, the prognosis for stablecoins. So thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. That.